Well hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wildry Garden and in this video I'm going to be telling you the best five things you can do to help wildlife in your garden as we approach the autumn time. We're now into September and as we go into October in this video I'm going to be telling you some top tips as to how you can really help your local wildlife. So number one is don't cut your hedges yet. Now, as is the case with this wonderful specimen behind me, you can see it's a beautiful Gelder Rose, which is absolutely covered in these lovely little red berries at the moment that look absolutely like red currants and they are just an irresistible snack to so much wildlife over the coming months. So whether that's our visiting Scandinavian birds, whether that's our mammals when they drop off this shrub behind me, or whether that's the insects that are going to visit them as they start to over ripen, they really are a fantastic source. It's nature's larder, if you like, this is. And they've been obviously growing over the last couple of months to produce these beautiful fruits that you can see behind me. So yes, number one is don't cut your hedges too soon because not only Gelder Rose, we've got things in the UK like sloes uh, from the Blackthorns, we've got um, rose hips as well, we've got hawthorn berries, we've got blackberries. So if you cut your hedges back, what you're going to do is remove all of that natural food source for so much wildlife. So my advice to you guys, if you really want to cut your hedge, is manage it on a rotation. So cut maybe one side one year, one side the next year, or the top one year and the side the next year if you share it with a neighbor just so that you can let the flowers obviously flower and then develop into fruit. A lot of the fruit will only flower on the previous year's growth. So if they cut every single year, quite often you'll find that actually they never get the chance to flower or even bury a lot. Sadly, like the hedgerows that I see on my travels around the UK where they are just flailed, sometimes even mid season as well when there are birds nesting. We're outside of that window now, but my advice to you guys would be to cut your hedges back sort of end of February time, but not too far into March before some birds thinking, are thinking about building nests again. So yes, once all the fruit is gone, that's the ideal time. And at the moment, obviously you'll still be insects and caterpillars and things munching on the leaves of these hedgerows, obviously, and these shrubs. So obviously they're going to lose a habitat again if you cut your hedges back too early. So number one, don't cut your hedges just yet. So number two, is leave some areas of longer vegetation, grass in particular, because as you can hear behind me, there are grasshoppers everywhere. And of course, things like this ragwort, which is now in flower, which is providing a nectar source for this small white butterfly. I had to check it wasn't a green veined white. And it's an absolutely vital nectar source at this time of year when all the late emerging insects are coming out and in particular our butterflies as you can see. And if you haven't seen already guys, check out a video I did just recently on the channel about um, the importance of leaving some longer areas in particular. So a full video on that one uh, and in particular a plant called uh, perennial sow thistle which I think is a brilliant plant so I'll put a link to that one at the end of this one. But yes, leave some longer areas of vegetation because so many of our grassland habitats are cut down at this time of year. And as you can hear, the grasshoppers are in full force. They are literally everywhere. Everywhere I walk through this longer area of grassland where I'm working at the moment, they're, they're sort of pinging away in front of me, if you like, and moving like kind of waves as you go through the grass. So to simply cut all this back right now would be a catastrophe and they would lose the rich habitat in which they are living in. So leave some longer areas of vegetation. Not only that, it provides a great hunting ground for small frogs at this time of year. Obviously they've developed from the tadpoles in our ponds and they've moved out of the pond and they're now hunting through longer grassy areas for smaller insects. So having some longer vegetation gives them cover, stops them from being predated by bigger animals. And not only that, it gives them some uh, cover all through the winter time as well. So when they, when it is warmer on some days, for example, they might want to come out to hunt. Same with newts, um, same with toads as well. Um, so it's really important to have these longer vegetation areas. And it also provides somewhere for things like hedgehogs to snuffle through to find insects to eat as well. So longer areas of vegetation i can't stress it enough is really important to leave some all year so yes please guys leave some of these 
little patches around the edges of your garden if nowhere else because you'll be amazed at how much wildlife is going to continue to use them especially spiders as well i should say this time of year now september is the month for spiders you'll no doubt see like i've just seen this morning where i'm working this beautiful cobweb absolutely just covered in dew which is just a real september sight for me and it's a very very good month for spiders so those of you that are a bit squeamish <laughs> then uh, yeah don't go out in your garden at this time of year only kidding they won't bite most of them won't bite it's only the little garden spider anyway I won't go down that route now <laughs> to scare you and put you all off but no spiders obviously a vital part of our uh, life chain if you like they are providing a lot of food for things like wrens dunnocks as well so many birds will eat spiders so and actually spiders are the majority of a swifts diet would you believe it or not when they are sort of being transported on webs swifts will eat a lot of spiders throughout their life so yes it really is incredible the amount of life you can attract and dragonflies as well where i'm working at the moment there are literally dozens of migrant hawkers hunting over some of the longer grassy areas which is absolutely wonderful to see and they're only here because of the insects that are associated Associated with the longer grassy areas so yes and just above that even while it's not autumn properly yet the bats will be coming out to hunt the insects that are over longer grassy areas at night as well so by leaving some longer grass you are in fact providing for everything that could possibly visit your own wildlife garden so number three and contrary to what I've just been saying September and October are the perfect time to carry out a hay cut on your wildflower meadow. Now, if you guys have been brave enough to venture down the hashtag no mow summer route, which is what I've been banging on about since the spring, then hats off to you. I really hope it's opened your eyes as to how much wildlife has visited your garden because of this simple concept of not mowing your lawn through the summer months and seeing what's turned up. And if you've done that and you're now thinking it's looking a bit tired, then obviously, as we've just been saying, some areas of longer vegetation is still key to the survival of many of the invertebrates that you've just attracted to your garden this summer time. So if you mow everything and leave it as a blank canvas, then they will have nowhere to overwinter. So um, it's best you have a mosaic and you leave some of those longer areas. But if you want to cut some of your meadow, September and October is a good time. Another very good reason for doing this is because it's also good to let the flowers underneath breathe. If you've got quite a fertile meadow and the grass and the vegetation has grown up to waist height and it's now starting to fold over, in particular as we got to get into October and we potentially get more rain and more wind, it's going to sort of smother those uh, younger spring and smaller spring plants, things such as primrose, cowslips, uh, and all the sort of spring flowers, cuckoo flowers, maybe ragged robin if you're on a wetter site, then they're gonna want some air to breathe and to sort of grow their basal rosette, their, their leaves at the base of the plant for readiness as to go through winter and then to send up the flower spikes in the spring. So if the vegetation is left too long and it smothers them, that can actually kill them off in time. So it's very good practice to cut and importantly, remove all those cuttings from your hay meadow or your wildflower meadow or your Nomo summer meadow, whatever you want to call it at this time of year. I'm going to myself be carrying out a few hay cuts as we get towards the middle of September from then onwards. I, obviously, as a, on, a, on a commercial basis, it's hard for me to do it all at exactly the right time, but I always leave areas of vegetation around the margins. I always leave all the cuttings on site and I always make sure that it's as late as physically possible before the weather changes. So <laughs> it's a very, very uh, tough task for me in and amongst everything else I'm trying to do at this time of year in terms of meadow creation um, and creating ponds and everything else that I do so uh, but for you guys it's a little bit easier so you've got the beauty of time over the coming weeks to pick a day when you think do you know what there really is not a lot of activity now in terms of insect life uh, and when you do cut guys I will always say cut on a high setting don't scalp your lawn completely or your meadow completely cut on as high a setting as possible ideally three or four inches because a lot of the larvae and the insects and all the grubs and beetles and everything will be in those 
uh, in the base of those tussocks of those grasses. So it's best to leave a little bit of vegetation if you can, which will obviously help. So number three is get out there and cut your meadow from kind of the middle of September onwards. And I've recently done a video on uh, how and when to manage uh, wildflower meadow in more detail. So check that video out at the end of this one. But number three is get ready to cut your meadow over the next two months. So number four guys is get out there and make a wildflower meadow. Now you don't quite have to do it on the scale that I'm doing it here, which is a project that I'm filming for you guys, obviously that will be coming to the channel in the future when I've been back to film it. I'm in South Lincolnshire and I am creating a, about a third of an acre little mini nature reserve here. I'm making a wildflower meadow in the middle. We've got a massive, great big 18 meter by 12 meter wildlife pond. One of the biggest wildlife ponds I've created with a liner so really looking forward to bringing you guys this one and we've got native trees and shrubs and everything else so going to be a really exciting project but for you guys getting out in your own garden and creating a wildflower meadow at this time of year is the perfect time why do you think all the farmers are frantically going around their fields at the moment trying to drill all their crops in because it's the perfect time of year september and as we go into october You've still got the ground temperature for germination in the soil, but also it's getting a little bit cooler. Although today <laughs> it's 27 degrees and it is almost the second week in September. So it's rather hot, shall we say, almost like an Indian summer. But creating a wildflower meadow in your own garden is a really good idea at this time of year because you can sow the seed. Obviously, there's many ways you can create a wildflower meadow and check out the video I've done, which is how to make a mini wildflower meadow on the channel. Oh, I can't put 10 different links to the end of this video, but you'll find it on the channel. If you just search for wildflower meadow on this channel, you will come up, or it will bring up the link to that video. So check that out. Obviously we sell the uh, plugs, the seed and the nine centimeter potted wildflowers. If you're in the UK, we can of course ship to you, no problem at all. So you can create one of these incredible habitats because they are up there with a wildlife pond for the best thing that you can do to help wildlife in your own garden. They will provide for bats, butterflies, bees, moths, dragonflies, hedgehogs, foxes, badgers, birds, you name it, everything will use the beautiful habitat that is a wildflower meadow. So yes, even if it's only tiny guys, remember my wildflower meadow in my front garden, if you've seen any of those videos, it's not even three square meters. So, and that's had a massive impact on the insect diversity and the wildlife in general that has visited and been drawn to my front garden that is not even, well, it's about 20 square meters. So no excuses guys, as long as you've got a few square meters, you can create a wildflower meadow and as I say, check out the wildyourgarden.com online shop for any products you're after to help you try to make one of these invaluable habitats for wildlife in your own garden. And before I tell you the fifth and final point, guys, I should just say, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. It does the world of good in terms of pushing these videos out to a wider audience so that we can collectively help try to create more habitats around the world to spread the message of the no mow summer, of leaving longer grassy areas, of making wildlife ponds. Everything you guys have seen on this channel so far, it spreads the message even further, which is of course the main reason behind the channel itself. So yes, please hit that subscribe button. It really does help and it means the world to me to have your support. And also if you hit the little bell notification button, you will of course be notified every time I post a new video, which is every Sunday at 6 p.m. here in the UK. So without further ado, let's crack on with point number five. So point number five and my final point in this video today is get out there and get yourself a wildlife pond. It may sound obvious, but having a water source in your garden is, it is the best thing. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's the best thing you can do for wildlife in your own garden, even if it's just a barrel pond. If you've got a rented property, for example, and you can't, you're not allowed to dig in the garden uh, or dig a pond, then make a little wildlife barrel pond and obviously check out on the channel, I've already done a video as to how you can make your own little wildlife barrel pond. 
Um, but if you have got the luxury of your own garden or a community space or an allotment, then get out there and get a liner in the ground and just get some water in it. Even if it's just a simple structure or an old sort of Belfast sink, you know, an old bathtub, as long as there's good access for wildlife in and out in terms of putting some logs or rocks or cobbles so nothing drops in and ends up unfortunately drowning, which does happen a lot, I'm sorry to say, uh, with swimming pools. Uh, so access is the key thing to any water body, whatever you put in your own garden. But get a wildlife pond in your garden because I promise you it will be a really, really rewarding thing. I still get emails from all over the world from people saying what they've done and I'm still working on that video for you guys. I know it's been over a year in the making, but <laughs> there's been so many people that have emailed in that I asked to email in uh, if they'd made a pond off the back of one of the videos, particularly the three-part series I've done of how to make the ultimate wildlife pond. So for those of you that are well accustomed to my videos and that series of videos in particular and have made your own wildlife pond, hats off to you. I'm sure you'll be seeing the benefits of just how much wildlife has turned up. But yes, please guys, get out there, get some water in your garden some way, in some way, because it really does attract so much life. And at this time of year, September and October can often be the best months for dragonflies. As you've already seen on the video, the dragonflies over some of the grassy areas in this garden have been absolutely incredible, particularly as we go into the evening, they seem to congregate and hunt. And behind the camera, there's loads of grass and wildflowers that you can't see, which have had dozens and dozens of drag dragonflies, in particular migrant hawkers, hawking all over it. And with them being in the garden already, they will, of course, still be looking for new sites to lay their eggs potentially. So uh, not just the migrant hawkers, but other species as well. We've got common darter, southern hawker, um, maybe a few emperors still around. So there's lots of dragonflies still around. So it's not too late to get them laying eggs in your pond if you roll up your sleeves and get on with it uh, this autumn, because then over the next year or two, depending on how long they are in the water as a larvae for, you might get a generation of dragonflies emerging the following year. So next year could be the earliest that you've got dragonflies emerging from your pond. How amazing would that feel? So yes, a water body at this time of year is absolutely vital. Everything's still about butterflies, bees will drink from it. Uh, foxes, hedgehogs, badgers, obviously uh, deer, if you've got them in your garden, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, depends on how you look at it. Um, but yes, lots of wildlife will be using a pond to bathe, to drink and to carry out their life cycles. So a wildlife pond, obviously, if you're looking to build one and you're in the UK, guys, we have the fleece, the liner, all the pond plants, lilies, oxygenators still available. And we do have the online shop coming very, very soon. So yes, do check that out if you haven't. We've already got it there, obviously, but we've got a new website coming very soon but obviously we're still shipping. So if you guys need any of the plants and you've got a wildlife pond that you've just finished or you're about to do one, then check out the three part series and get yourself on the wildyougarden.com online shop. So I hope today's video has opened your eyes as to how you can be helping wildlife as we move from summer, although it doesn't feel like it today, into, uh, into the autumn months and how you can get your garden ready for wildlife over the coming weeks and as always guys thank you so much for the support any questions drop them in the comments below i'll do my very best to answer but of course it's extremely busy times for me at the moment right up until kind of november when it it just the pressure eases a little bit as i get into november but up until then i'm sowing meadows i'm making ponds of which i'm going to have uh, a massive pond in here as i've already said so uh, yeah looking forward to doing that as we move into next week got the liner turning up in two days time. So anyway, thank you so much for watching guys. I really appreciate it and I will see you all very soon. Mm -hmm.